death is not in vain. After this day, we gonna keep on marching. After this day, we gonna keep demanding justice. That is Reverend Jamal Bryant giving the eulogy for Freddie Gray, that message of hope coming just before Baltimore exploded in violence. Young people rampaged through parts of the city through the night, rioting, looting, and burning. Now in the morning after, I'm joined by Reverend Bryant from Baltimore. So Reverend, what do you make of the violence that took place last night in Baltimore? Absolutely inexcusable and uh, very painful to even watch. Uh, even looking at the footage, uh, being a native Baltimorean is uh, disheartening and, and unnerving. And one of the reasons why is yesterday, uh, because of the funeral, there was supposed to be no demonstrations and no protests. Uh, so for that to take place uh, at all is uh, heart-wrenching. And for the day as well that we called for a moratorium is perplexing. Why do you think it happened? I, I think it happened that uh, our young people are uh, very much frustrated uh, and misguided. Uh, I think that the mayor made a mistake by closing schools on today. I think that they needed to be uh, uh, gathered together. And because they have not, uh, we've opened up our church uh, for high schoolers to come and meet us there so that we can have a day of really imparting into them wisdom and understanding. Uh, the first part of the day and the second part of the day, we're taking them into the street to clean up what they messed up uh, because this is our community and we have a responsibility to govern ourselves. Let me ask you a little bit about uh, the response from the mayor and the governor, uh, the National Guard coming in. I didn't realize that. So there are no schools that are open today in Baltimore. You think that this kind of approach is the wrong approach? I think it's a wrong approach. When you look at the footage, it was primarily yesterday during the day. High schoolers, at least if there was school, we could have had uh, general assemblies and gave some redress to what took place. Uh, but parents have to go to work. They have to make a, a, a living. 60% uh, of our city, regrettably, uh, is uh, in a bad financial condition, so they don't have the luxury of taking off from work. Uh, and so today we want to really uh, maximize the moment, if you would, uh, and try to instill into them uh, the value of nonviolence and how it is that we get no justice by burning down CVS uh, or burning down a senior center. Uh, and this is not the right way in order for us to advance our cause. You know, earlier I was speaking with Manir, Manir Bahar from the 300 Men March, and he was saying part of the problem is some of the chants that we hear at these marches, no justice, no peace. And that it, it, is some of the language, the, 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 the thing that is sparking some of this violence, and does some of the language need to change in terms of how community leaders like yourself speak to young people? Yeah, you do understand in any criminal municipality, uh, disturbing the peace and assault or uh, vandalism are two separate uh, charges. Uh, Black America has always protested nonviolently uh, and been able to do so uh, by disturbing the peace. So we're 50 years away uh, from the walking across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, having to face uh, Bull Connor and that kind of racism. Uh, and we were able to defy it, drinking at water fountains we shouldn't have had and uh, eating at lunch counters. We were disturbing the peace, not breaking glasses, not injuring police officers, and not flipping over cars. Uh, and so that qualification has to be addressed on this afternoon. And yet you talk about how there has been equality, but you also talk about the challenges that young black men in America face today in the year 2015. We still have a long way to go. Right now, while we're speaking, there are 860,000 black men who are in jail. Uh, one million black men are under penal supervision. This is all the more alarming when you would consider there are total 2,200,000 men uh, who are incarcerated across the United States. How are we 15% uh, of the U.S. population, but 67% uh, uh, 50 percent, rather, of the prison population. There's a grave inequity that has to be addressed. Uh, and Loretta Lynch, who has just been confirmed as our attorney general, uh, has a yeoman's job ahead of her on what it is she's going to have to do. In the days ahead, do you think that the National Guard being deployed into the streets of Baltimore and the curfew for everyone that begins tonight at 10 p.m. is going to help the situation or is it going to possibly make the situation worse? I, I, I'm not sure. It's 5,000 troops on the ground. I think that's an exorbitant amount, uh, a little bit excessive, if you ask me. Uh, but I don't know how it is that you punish and heal at the same time. 
uh, tonight at our church. We're having a town hall meeting uh, at 7.30 p.m. for the community to be able uh, to lift and lend their discontentment, uh, but also to give the community an opportunity to discuss solutions, uh, because it's not enough to just be angry. We've got to seek out some answers. Can you tell me how the family of Freddie Gray is doing and how they're feeling about what's happening? Very disappointed. This is not what they wanted uh, the name of their son uh, to be connected to uh, in a very fragile, emotional place, but still optimistic uh, that, like the Phoenix, we can rise from the ashes and start a new chapter right here in the city of Baltimore. Reverend, we appreciate you taking the time. That's Reverend Jamal Bryant speaking to me from Baltimore. Thank you.